Hello. So, today's topic, which is always a fun one, is revolutionary battles. Now, there is a slight change from the live. Some people thought I was too harsh on the British in the American Revolutionary War. Apparently, apparently, I did not recognize the significant efforts of the various forces there and how hard they strove. Yeah, but the trouble is those forces were striving in completely wrong ways. We'll leave that to one side and we'll get into that. Ah, oh, it's gonna be fun, and trust me, I have got some fair equal comparisons to point out why I'm quite so annoyed with the fall of Boston, and why the whole thing makes no sense in terms of it as a strategic thing. But leave that to one side. Revolutionary Battles, Battle of Rice Boats and Battle of San Nicholas. Because <sighs> believe it or not, there are still people who think that I am purely jingoistic. Oh, I don't know. So, shameless book plug. <laughs> right then, revolutionary battles. Now, both of these are small battles. One is ignored because Well, it probably didn't matter much unless you were there to you as a specific, as an individual battle. It mattered more in the context of the wider campaign. And the impact it showed that was taking place on the wider campaign. And the fact is that the Battle of Rice Boats is literally about rice boats. It's literally about boats later carrying, uh, carrying cargoes of rice. It's that fundamental. And the Battle of San Nicolas, well... That isn't written about much because, well, certainly not in the English-speaking world, but um, even in the Spanish-speaking world, it doesn't seem to be written about that much. Probably because the side which wins the war loses it. And it's not where their great admiral, who comes out of it, fights. It's not even a learning experience for him, really. It's just a short, sharp, nasty naval action. And the side which loses, well... Honestly, at the time they're losing, they are fighting far, far more pressing concerns in their homeland than worrying about a sharp, sharp, nasty naval battle on a river in a territory that's a colony. Or a former colony. Very shortly after that. The Battle of Rice Boats, well, it's part of the Revolutionary War, the American Revolutionary War. But you have to remember that's the same war which then gets subsumed into the Anglo-French War of 1778 to 1783. And of course, the Spanish join that war as well. So it's a, it's a complicated scenario going on, okay? It is a far wider conflict, but it's also it is also a good example of how to lose a war from the side of the British. Because it's how not to run a war. And one of the interesting questions that came up during the discussions and live was, how do the British actually coordinate efforts? Well, theoretically, operations 
are coordinated through their secretaries of state. You have a prime minister by this time. It is Lord North. Talking about him, uh, him in a bit. You have a secretary of state of the North, who deals with Europe. Secretary of state of the South who deals with issues in the rest of the world, and a Secretary of State of America, who runs America. Now, this is a, there is a reason for this. There is a perception of the importance of America in both French and British strategic thinking, which is out of all proportion to its then current realistic value. Okay? And there is a problem when you start saying that as a British historian. Because you are going to run into one of three groups of people. There are the people who think you're therefore being rude about America. You're not. You're basically saying that Guess what? You weren't exactly the amazing, capable industrial nation that you become, even in nascent form at that time. You were mostly a very large agrarian economy. And not always the most productive agrarian economy either. Sorry. But that's the reality. There's also an argument that actually the richest parts of you, as far as the British are concerned at that point, were the fisheries and the fur trade. And they managed to control, keep control of the colonies which provided them with that. I.e. Canada. However, you also then run into the people who are going... Ah, so you're a revisionist historian, and therefore you're saying these things, you're agreeing with me that all these things were pointless. Which is wrong again. Because that's not what I'm saying. Saying something is less valuable than it was perceived at the time. That this popular idea that it was the loss of the American colonies, the British would no longer have enough sailors to man their fleet. Is, and, you know, the entire Royal Navy would fall apart and um, that the British economy would completely falter because trade of America was its critical key trading partner. Saying that that is not correct is not the same as saying that America has no importance. It is important. It's important enough that they fought wars over it. Seven Years' War example. There was a lot of fighting in the Americas over the scenario with the French, etc. That's part of it. Now. Now. The third group, the third group you run into, are the tea boots. Let's be honest. I love them dearly. They provide me with endless fun. Because the first rule of history is the moment you start looking for it, myth busting basically become, uh, gets changed to. So, popular histories, which don't do any research and just repeat the headlines from the time and perpetuate their myths, there are good popular histories and there are bad popular histories, really do sell well, don't they? It's not myth-busting. It's headline-busting. It's propaganda-busting. And then you realise there's propaganda from both sides involved that the Americans puff up their importance, first of all, to try and get a bigger say with the British government over what's going on, and then to try and get allies to come and support them, because the best way they can get allies, French, 
and Spanish, although both the French and the Spanish seem to have the pol the idea that um, they will win the War of Britain and then will double cross the Americans and take back take territories off them. Yeah, they're such lovely allies. It's always fun. Anyway, leaving that to one side. Life happens, so that, that doesn't happen. But, you know, it's fun. They are trying to bank out there as important as they can be so that they will support, those allies will support them in order to cripple Britain. In Britain at the same time, you have a lot of internal politics. You have those who are pushing a return to the strategy of the Seven Years' War, which was mostly naval engagements and wandering around. You have those who are pushing for a continental army, when Britain has no allies to form up a continental army with in the Anglo-French War, because they've allowed themselves to become... And this is when you get into the run into another current screen of politics, because the moment you start talking like this, people go, oh, so like Brexit? No. Not like Brexit, okay? In the nicest way, Britain's still a member of NATO. Britain's still got diplomatic relations with the European nations. You have no idea how far you have to go to get to the level of isolationism which has been managed to allow to occur for the Anglo during the Anglo-French War. Alright? Not even Portugal has good relations with us. So, please, again, don't pick that up and go, ah, Brexit, no, no, don't. Because for both sides, it's a terrible connection to make. Because if you're pro-Brexit, Let's be honest, descending to that level, if you could talk, talk about that, people are going to go, so you think we're going to descend to that level? That's not a good case. And if you're anti-Brexit, and you make the case, ah, oh, it's like the British and the Anglo-French War of 1778, 1783, you have just, uh, all they have to do is turn around and go, but we're still a member of NATO, we're still in this, we're still in that. And you suddenly have to go, well, yes, but you're, okay, you're in NATO, and yes, you're in, and the moment you have to say yes to your opponent, well, yes, you're right, we are still in that, you undermine all your arguments. Okay? Or you can try and say, no, we're not in NATO, I suppose, you could try and make that argument, but I think that would make you look kind of ludicrous. So... Britain has managed to get completely isolated. And has the continental strategy, the traditional naval strategy, and it has the people who are obsessed with fighting in America strategy because they believe, because they have stated their, staked their political careers on it. And they're in real trouble because, well, we're going to get into them, but they make an interesting crop. Okay, your traditional naval strategy, but sadly enough, your least rich, uh, most professional, most capable member of the government is this gentleman, John Montague, for the sandwich. Him and Charles Gravier, Comte de Vergines, are pretty much the only two in this entire list of people I have any time for at all. These two... This one is the one who kept called negative because he keeps saying what we need to do is keep the Navy in the UK to deal with the, the French. And frankly, we don't need a mass fleet to go off and fight the, uh, fight the Americans. And as long as we have naval control and win the naval war with the French and always make sure they are not going to get involved in our fight, we're fine. You have Lord North, 2nd Earl Guildford. Um... I, there is this lovely quote about him in here. Right then. In, in critical times, it is necessary there should be one directing minister who should plan the whole of the operations of government and control the other departments of administration so far as to make them cooperate zealously and actively with his designs, even though contrary to their own. 
Lord North is certainly not capable of being such a minister as he has described. When you admit yourself that as Prime Minister you are useless, you should probably not be there. This is a government that is going to vacillate. Absolutely. And it vacillates between the very capable, but not rich, so therefore not as influential as he needs to be, Lord Sandwich, who's trying to put forward the naval maritime case. And George Germain. George Germain. A self-obsessed, self-egotistical, absolute, pointless example of a personality. And sadly enough, a model for far too many politicians in our modern day and age. And probably what I'm going to say next is going to get this video demonetized. Because once I start talking about politicians in this level, this is going to cause me trouble. This is the man who had had a military career and then well, as much as you have a military career in the time, and then a political career. Now, a military career, which started as a captain in the 7th Horse of the later 6th Dragoon Guards, transferred to the Gloucester Regiment of Foot as a lieutenant colonel, took part in the War of Austrian uh, Succession, took part in the Battle of Fontenoy, uh, leading a charge of the Duke of Cumberland's infantry in 1745. Where he was taken to the tent of Louis XV after being captured and injured. And during the Seven Years' War, he was considered for the post of Commander-in-Chief North America, which went to Edward Braddock, of course, who made his false disaster during the Braddock campaign, and was promoted to Major General and returned to active service to oversee ordnance. In 1758, he was given a 4th Regiment and joined Duke of Marlborough as a Lieutenant General. He was sworn on the Privy Council in 17, for January 1758. This is a stellar career. Takes part and second in command of the raid on St. Malo. And then... He joins forces with the Duke of Ferdinand of Brosnac in Germany. When Marlborough dies, Sackville becomes Commander-in-Chief of the British Army Contingent. Under the command of the Duke of Brunswick. And this is where you start to see, uh, see what the man has become. Because up until this point... He's had a very successful career with someone else in charge. He's now in charge. The Battle of Minden takes place on the 1st of August 1759. The British and Hanoverian infantry on the centre advance on the French cavalry and artillery in that sector. They probably went without orders. And their formation even managed to repulse repeated French cavalry charges by holding their fire until the last possible moment, then a massive volley, volley when the enemy were 10 yards away. It was absolutely terrifying. But again, Germain doesn't seem to be involved in this and neither is he stopping it. Okay? Those are his troops, but he's doing nothing about it. Most senior officers involved seem to be some colonels who, well, basically decided their troops were going forward, so I thought they might as well go with them. As the French started to fall back in the face of this very, very, very surprisingly well-organised but completely unplanned assault, which is probably why the French were so surprised about it, because not even the people in charge of it knew it was going to happen, let alone the French. Um, Fernand sends an order to Germain to order a cavalry charge. 
let loose his cavalry to complete the victory. This is where the problem comes up. Because if you're an astout general, strategist, that's what you do. No, Sackville withholds permission for advance. Fernand sends his order again and again and again. Sackville never gives that order. Why? The commander of the British cavalry is Lord Granby. Okay? He's a perfectly fine cavalry officer. But he and Sackville happened to be having an argument at the time. And so he withheld permission, and we know this, from Granby in order for Granby to not gain glory through an attack. Now, this, of course, goes down really well with the senior British minister, the ambassador in the area, and the uh, with Fernand. S Sackville, as he's currently known, Viscount Sackville, um, Germain, gets cashiered, which means he gets his money returned to him and told, bye-bye, you're out of the army. And Granby is actually promoted to replace him as commander of the British contingent for the remainder of the war. Hmm, that's good. However, Germain is an idiot. And he manages to show his idiocy even more than normal people do. If he was an admiral by this point, he'd already be strung up by his neck or shot on his own quarterdeck. But no, the army have cashiered him. They have sent him home. He could go home in peace and quiet. Sackville refused to accept the responsibility for refusing to obey orders. He didn't feel he had done anything wrong. He didn't understand the concept that you act in the national interest when you're in command of His Majesty's or Her Majesty's or whatever matter at the time, matter, whatever Majesty's forces. You do not act in your own interest. You do not go. I don't want to give that order because that would give him glory. You go, I want to win this battle. Who's going to get the glory for winning the battle? Me! Doesn't matter how I use my commanders. Yes, he's going to get some glory, but I'll get the higher glory. If you have to be motivated by self-interest. But realistically, you should be going, I want to win the battle. Not, but who's going to get the write-ups in the press? He caused such a fuss that in 1760, the next year, he demanded and got a court-martial. He thought this was going to find him innocent. This was going to show that he had done the right thing. You know, it was, in it was an important battle. Unfortunately, he defends himself. Unfortunately. And um, the court found him guilty. And again, uh, the, the, what I love is they impo imposed what is considered under the army terms one of the strangest and strongest verdicts ever ended against a general officer. You can tell this is the army, not the navy. He's still breathing. Because the court's verdict upheld his discharge, but ruled that he was unfit to serve his majesty in any military capacity whatsoever, and ordered that their verdict be read to and entered into the orderly book of every regiment in the army. This meant that every regiment in every in the army had it in their order books that if any orders came from George Germain, Viscount Sackville, he was not to issue them instructions as a military commander. The king even had his name struck from the Privy Council rolls. Okay, now we can all be slightly sad that unfortunately, unfortunately, in 
he still lived. Because, and why do I say unfortunate? Because if you consider what would have happened to an admiral who did refuse his orders, even later on, in, and actually he goes causes, there's a whole incident because of the way the politics are running at the time, and there's a admiral who I have... I have a lot of affection for Admiral Keppel, but his handling of an incident later on in the war, in the Anglo-French war, is frankly absurd that he allows it to be taken advantage of by the politics at the time. And I know that's what the politics were doing at the time. I know that's the politics at the time, but Keppel ended up causing he, him, himself to have to be removed from position and never get another command, and his subordinate, his second-in-command, to be removed from command by allowing his nephew to make false allegations about his second-in-command in the papers under an immunity and not just sending a note to the papers going, that's twaddle. Because of politics. The one advantage you have in this whole sorry mess of the American Revolutionary War and the Anglo-French War that comes afterwards is that after it, whilst there will still be occasions when member, when the armed services will engage in politics and play politics, they will never again let it get that far. And when they do, they will suffer problems. In fact, Jervis, the real stain on his character, the reason he's forgotten despite all the greatness he achieves, in many regards is because he was the last naval ad admiral who really did engage in party politics. And from that point onwards, they didn't like it. The point when you're in the service is you're in, you put the nation first. You do what's best for the nation. Not party. And certainly not personal. Now, unfortunately, he was still alive. And unfortunately, he becomes a favourite of George III. The king. At the time. The king has cashiered him. The king has discharged him from the army. But... The king has also allowed him to become his friend and will support him in various actions. Now, they had hoped that there would be a political solution and to the American Revolution. But there's a problem for that. A. And please note, he's very much a constitutional... George III is the reason he's not up here, is a constitutional monarch, and he really does act in that way, bowing always to his minister's advice. And this guy and this guy are the two who are sort of teaching him. Lord North, during the Falklands incident with Spain, had used the threat of mobilisation of the fleet to cow the French and the Spanish to stop them getting involved and to award it in his own favour. So I always thought he would have that in option. And... Germain, well, Germain believes that he can now be a general without being a general. He can be an ad facto commander in chief without deploying in the field. Despite having an absolutely chronic misunderstanding of the geography, the economics, 
the actual war fighting scenario and the politics of what he was dealing with, he thought he was amazing. He entered Parliament first in 1733. Uh, he served terms in both Dublin and Westminster. He served as Chief Secretary for Ireland during his father's second term as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. And, well, George II, with the help of George III, I should point out, uh, George III comes to power in 1760, in October 1760. Up until that point, he, you know, he, he he's the grandson of George II, who had been in power previously. And George II had been a far stronger personality. George II had cashiered him, but it also had cashiered, had been the actual king to cashier, as it's called, Germain. But George III had been involved in that. However, George III still is fairly impressionable, as said, as a constitutional monarch, and in his approach to things, especially in his early career, and likes to support his friend, George Germain, who seems to understand him. Oh, God. Lord help us all. Anyway. Their first belief was that Europe was settled now, thanks to the Seven Years' War. That Britain could do, especially after the Forgesons, Britain could do what it wanted to the colonies with no one else taking part. Uh, Charles Gravier, Comte de Vergrins, would disagree with that. He was a very active French minister and was very keen on rebuilding and re changing the status quo. And he would use whatever he could get to do that. So, as said, Germain is the Chief Secretary for Ireland, and then he sort of has a bit of a quiet time after 1760, and in 1765, George III returns him to the roles of the Privy Council, because after five years, and he's my friend! Now this is important, because you have to be on the roles of the Privy Council at this time, really, to be considered for a ministry post. Yes, you can be technically entered into the roles for that, but, you know, In 1769, Lady Elizabeth Germain dies without any heirs, and her estates, including Drayton in North Hampshire, go to George. Now, so this means after this means that sort of after 1770, he's known as Lord George Germain. And why am I giving all this detail? Because he's the one in charge. He's in 1775 now, so if we think about that, 16 years after Midden, 15 years after he's been that court-martial, he is appointed Secretary of State for the American Department, replacing Lord Dartmouth in this post, which is no massive loss, but it still was an actual coherent individual in terms of logic. This is what makes Germain the Prime Minister responsible for the Americas. He now has the power to promote or relieve generals, to take organ and provisions and supplies, and basically run the strategic planning of the war, thanks to Lord North being, as we've discussed, not really the up to the task, and George III listening to his ministers. And unfortunately, Everyone else is rather indisposed on other things. Now, here is a first example of what he does. In 1776, he works with General Burgoyne on a plan, and 
issues orders for the Sarah Tukasoga campaign. He now sends unclear orders to General Howe. So instead of General Howe marching to meet up with Burgoyne, Howe marks in a completely different operation, uh, in a completely different direction. Has a victory, but Burgoyne suffers a defeat. <sighs> I can't think why, because it was supposed to be a plan where Burgoyne and Howe would meet up with each other, march towards each other, and catch the Americans in between. Instead, they allowed the Americans to fight one army and ignore the other. While well, the other went off and won some victories, but they were small ones, versus the defeat of Burgoyne. He then tried to keep the emphasis focused on the War of Independence, even after the French, Spanish, and Dutch Republic all entered the war. And it got worse. He even tried in 1779 to send one of his associates, Richard Cumberland, to Madrid for, for, for talks to try and get a separate peace with Spain, which was his bright idea. There is a debate as to whether this is with, with or without cabinet support, or even cabinet knowledge. Interesting enough, he has to step down and is forced away in 1782. And if we consider how long the war goes on till, hmm, February, yeah, that, that, that would explain it. Now, why is this all a problem and why is he a particular problem? Well, I'm going to start listing it. There are boards of ordnance, there is victualling boards, all sorts of things which are set up by the Admiralty to run it. And if I give you an example again from Nicholas Rogers' book, and again I can talk about this. Um, by July 1776, the Navy and Victualing Boards had taken up over 146,000 tons of transport, 46,000 tons more than the maximum of the previous war. This took no account of transport chartered by the Ordnance Board or the Treasury, which was in effect Germain, which were responsible for victualling troops overseas. The Navy and Victualing Boards had long experience of this business and conducted it with frugal efficiency. But the Ordnance Board went in its own way, and Germain's guiding principle was to organise everything in his department differently from the Navy. Naval transport sailed under convoy, so Germain sent his unescorted. Navy Board tendered at a fixed price, i.e. they said, we'll buy this at this amount, are you prepared to sell it? So Germain outbid it and cleared the markets. Unfortunately for Germain, transports needed to be prote need to be protected because the rebels started sending out privateers and even regular warships as early as 1777. And um, things just got worse. One of the big problems for the Royal Navy comes in the whole idea was they could mobilise quickly. But to, in order to provide for all the ships, the frigates and everything else going out to North America Station, all the transports being chartered across and all the personnel having to do that, there was a shortage of sailors in the UK. And this meant that when they had to do a rapid mobilisation, they'd actually not been having the regular squadrons because that was putting a strain on the personnel requirements to feed the North Americas and sustain North America's because of the way he had been running it. Because, surprisingly enough, the ships he was chartering kept getting lost. Can't think why, sailing in unescorted convoy, unescorted and not in convoy. So they couldn't even offer mutual protection. At one point, there's even a threat of insurance companies that they won't insure are on the right ships which are leased by his department. It's it's a disaster. It's an absolute terrible thing going on. And combine that with him being just as picky as he was with Lord Grant me uh, back at Midden, and you have what's going on in the British High Command. And then you have poor Sandwich who is trying to get a fleet ready to fight in the UK. And at one point 
he actually when he actually does get some ships ready to deal with the French, he's ordered to send a squadron to North America because what happens if the French go to North America? The North American station doesn't have ships aligned. It'll be terrible. They could win a big battle versus them. The, the British ships aligned, which are sent after them, don't get there in time anyway, and it leads to a very very dicey scenario, especially when the Spanish join the French, and suddenly the British fleet is outnumbered in British waters in the Channel, and it's all, there's a real invasion scare. And it's because those ships have had to be sent across the Atlantic to where they can't really do much and aren't really that useful. But if you'd kept them in Europe, they would, of course, probably have allowed the British to either defeat the, Span uh, defeat the French early or maybe even fight the combined fleet. It would have been more difficult to fight the combined fleet, but considering the state the French Navy was on after sending out Esting Squadron to sail across the Atlantic and draw the British off, um, there is an actual chance that the British could have won it. Because the French were begging for food and ammunition and clean clothes off the Spanish fleet, their allies. And the Spanish were basically going, yeah, um, we're not sure if they're allies or beggars. So an actual naval battle could have been quite an interesting affair. And so this is the higher level strategy going on. And then this is the local picture. The local picture is being run by the Howes, with Admiral Howe in charge of the fleet, trying to work out what the, what the frigate is going on. And William Howe, the general in charge, who is... Him and his brother are equally self-serving. And at one point, his... He is they're looking at his brother to possibly become to replace Sandwich, the Admiral. And the, he is demanding promotions for both him and his brother. Huge amounts of money. And Jermaine being sacked. And that's considered abnormal even by the types of the states at the time for people to demand these things to be promoted in the post. So that's why Sandwich, in many ways, managed to survive so often, because every time there's a crisis and people want to replace him, the people who are, uh, who they could potentially look at are replacing him are all often asking for so much no one's to replace him. You have James Wright, his one, one, one redeeming quality you have to sort of consider is that he had been appointed governor in Carolina and Georgia long before, long before Jermaine uh, got his post. But the fact is he's doesn't see the writing on the rule, doesn't see what's going on, and doesn't manage to react with any haste to secure his own position let alone actually being effective, because his communications just keep getting intercepted again and again and again and again and again, and at no point does he seem to think, hang on, perhaps I should change my methodology. So he's not exactly the smart artist bushel uh, under the tree. Um, then we have how who... If you're being charitable, you can say he could easily misconstrue the orders Germain sent. But if you're uh, in any way an actual competent general, and you were thinking for national interest rather than personal gain, you would have probably worked out I should march to Burgoyne and join up with him. But then, of course, there'd be a dispute over who would actually be in charge of that joint army, and, oh, good lord, I might have to share my command. Um, then we have the local soldiers, the militia. Now, James Habersham and Lachlan McIntosh are both loyal Americans. Uh, Habersham, many times, takes the word of James Wright that he will not try and escape and communicate with the British ships when they arrive in the waters. And it's a case of, you're lovely, but you should not be in charge of anything which involves actually dealing with the other side. You are a fine military officer, but you are not the type of personality we want in charge of keeping prisoners um, at all. You are far too trusting an individual. And Lachlan McIntosh is 
well, you, you, you cannot say he doesn't have a level of aggression and devotion to duty, which is frankly excellent. And the Royal Navy officers who are involved and the Army officers who are involved, not pictured, are Andrew Barclay, Captain, Royal Navy, not pictured, and James Grant, who are both pretty darn professional and handle themselves pretty darn well. Now, let's start off with some background on the Battle of the, uh, the Rice Boats, because... So far, I've been talking about the whole thing of what's going on in America, in Britain, the strategic discussions at this point, and I'm basically discussing that all because of the issue, the scenario, because of that was sort of li missing from the previous video. In Georgia, tensions have been rising for a while, and slowly after the radicals were elected to the Georgia Provincial Congress, um, despite previously having been remaining relatively neutral, in, and they sort of take power in the summer of 1775, they start to strip James Wright of his powers as governor. And here's the first communications fail of Wright. He requested a naval presence near Savannah, the colony's capital. However, if you're writing in American terminology, patriots, if you're writing in British terminology, you'd say something different, but let's say those pro-America um, in Charleston, South Carolina, in managed to intercept his request and substitute it with a dispatch which um, indicated he did not need such support. Now, let's think about that for starters. Georgia has its own ports. They have ships come in and dock into it regularly. So, how is it, why is it going out to Charleston, South Carolina? Yes, it's, the, it's a major port, and it's not that far away, but the fact is, Wright hasn't arranged, despite the fact that, consider it, the American Revolutionary War starts in April 1775, and people have sort of seen things coming uh, uh, coming before then. And it's the summer. It's actually closer to July, June, July 1775, when those people, uh, the powerful, um, how do I put this, the uh, factions come uh, come to power. And it, it's sort of late 1775 when in when his one of his dispatches intercepted. So, in nicest way, there had been plenty of time for him to organise a secure means of communication. In fact, he's been in power and been in post since 1760. So why the frigate he hasn't got a a loyal personal guard? I do not know. Even if he hasn't got British Army soldiers, the fact that he hasn't built up a unit of local militia or something, which are de facto his personal guard, is really beyond me, considering the time. And secondly, which perhaps shows his lack of a tyrannical nature, or his lack of a suspicious nature, that he hasn't gone to that basic level of security of setting up his own of de facto organising a local unit of militia, which is pretty much his own people, where everyone in charge of it are people he has appointed who are loyal to him and him and the crown back in the home country. Uh, the fact he hasn't done that is interesting. He could have potentially... He could have potentially... And I, I, I do say I do uh, do say this sort of this is a potential one. Yeah. He could have asked for some invalids, um, as I explained in live, and I'll explain now. There's the courts of invalids in the UK, which are basically personnel who could be in the chair, who are uh, who are old retired uh, retired soldiers who've either been wounded or are. Uh, no longer fit or too old for service, and 
instead of them getting paid a pension and put in their Chelsea hospital, if they still want to do some active, some form of active service, they would get sent as extra companies to go and guard walls and things. They're not something you want in the field. They're not a unit you want to do field manoeuvres, but they're experienced soldiers, and they're willing to serve. And he could have got a company or a detachment of them sent to support him in the local area. That it would have been interesting, but let's be honest, considering the stuff especially Jermaine's been getting up to in the area, I think he could have got it as swung it. And that might have been enough to present him, prevent him uh, what happens, because A, if you've got a company like that around, I cannot imagine a company of <clears throat> veterans going, you know what, we're going to send our communications unescorted or by people we aren't sure we can completely trust. Or well, we can put them on a boat and set on with a crew we trust who are sending it straight out to sea and going that and going to go around the coast and straight to the naval base on the main base back up in Boston. That would have been sensible or Halifax. And these things sort of so carried on. His his powers are keeping stripped and he hasn't got any support and he keeps shouting his mouth off of people telling people that the there the Royal Navy is going to come he's sent for the Royal Navy good lord anyway at a certain point British warships and I use that term loosely began arriving at Tibby Island in January 1776. They're always described in some of the books, especially the ones which are the American histories of the American Revolutionary Wars, when they actually bother to mention this battle. They're men of war. Which always makes them sound like a very powerful warship. A man of war has arrived. Men of war are arriving. And you sort of go, hmm, not sure. And without even seeing them, he decide to tell people that this is the fleet that's been sent to punish the local rebels. In fact, they're the beginnings of a force which has been sent to get food and other provisions for the troops in Boston, which is under siege, and have been sent by General Howe, under, well, Admiral Howe at the request of General Howe. It's under the command of a captain, Andrew Barclay, and I'll be getting into his ships in a second. The arrival of the first ships in January 1776 prompted the Georgia Committee of Safety, and it's always great whenever an a, a, a area which you're, you know, basically having trouble is sets up a committee of safety. That's your first problem, because that committee of safety, which sounds so nice, is probably going to be the thing which is going to start issuing the orders. Always be wary of committees of safety. Any time anyone sets up a committee of safety and they do not have a very strict remit which limits them to literally health and safety, be worried about them. Or public committees of public security or public safety. Those are usually things which you have to worry about as committees go. Unless you're on the side of the revolutionary forces and you want the revolution to happen, then when they happen, hey, you've got an organizing group. And so, Joseph Havisham is sent to place Governor Wright under house arrest and extracts a promise from the governor that he would not attempt to communicate the British ships. However, at the same point, and this is a, the first one, oh. it's interesting to think about how could that have been happening, happened if he had a company of invalids guarding him. They would have had to fight to gain access to him. And again... That might have changed what would happen, but it would have also potentially changed the whole scenario because of the security, etc. Things could have been different. Wright continues to be harassed by pro independence people in the state in spite of his confinement, so he's now under house arrest, but they're not also protecting the house. And that's another thing, if you place someone under arrest, it's kind of like an embassy. 
the nation state which is hosting MC is responsible for its security externally. So every time you see people protesting outside an embassy, and people go, well, why don't they have more people to protect the embassy? It's because the nation state is supposed to be looking after it. And when the nation state stops protecting embassies, that can seem like a really powerful message because they're basically telling you to get out, but that can cause them a lot of diplomatic troubles because no one else tends to trust you to protect their embassies. Oh yeah, you didn't protect them. Well, you might not protect ours. And that stops, breaks off communications very quickly. Well, it's the same. If you place someone under house arrest under this sort of scenario, you have to protect them and that house. And if you're not... And we know he's not under proper guard or proper protection because he managed to escape the mansion on the night of the 11th of every 11th. And trust me, he's not the type who's going to think of really an advanced raid to escape. He's a he's a decent, if not a hard-working, but not exactly the most imaginative personality you're going to deal with. Made his way to a loyalist supporter. And the plantation of that loyalist supporter. And then was taken there to HMS Scarborough, where he met... Captain Andrew Barclay, who immediately went, oh, no. Oh, great. And when he was there, he then decided to write a letter to remaining members of his council which expressed frustration over getting assurances of safety and access to desired supplies from and access to desired, desired supplies from patriot authorities and all sorts of things and um well this is the fact that Georgia had already adopted along with the 12 colonies in other 12 colonies in 1904 the terms of the continental association which been created by the first Continental Congress, which banned trade with Great Britain. This meant that they're not going to give them the supplies, and he's writing letters to tell them, and he, therefore he's telling them what the British Navy want. I can just imagine Barclay's face. Oh, you're sending out more letters. What this did achieve was pretty much the remaining members of his council were all rounded up and the Americans were put on high alert. Now let's consider the Navy ships involved. And ah, oh, these are some fine warships. The fleet sent to purchase right and other projects in Georgia included HMS Scarborough a sick freight. Ah, oh, beautiful vessel. Beautiful vessel. Scarborough has a total of 20 guns. Don't worry, this HMS Cherokee there, which is a six-gun schooner. HMS Siren, which is also a sick freight. Um, about 20 guns again. 28 guns, theoretically, as in a full service of Enterprise class, but... Um, there seems to be some dispute as to how many guns she's actually carrying. HMS Raven, an eight-gun cutter slash fire ship. HMS Tamar, a sloop of war, which was 16 guns. And um, there's a the picture at the top on this screen. Uh, Scarborough is the um, picture at the bottom. And then HMS Hinchbrook, which was charitably described as a gun brig. Charitably described as a gun brig. Could have as many as 14 guns. And then two transports, HMS Whitby and Symmetry, which were armed on flute. Now, admittedly... I would admit that the North America station doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have any three deckers, doesn't have that many two deckers, because of Sandwich, because he doesn't think they're necessary out there. But I'm fairly certain 
that some of the larger ships, at least a, fifth, a couple of fifth rates, but probably a, a single two-decker, a 60 or 70 gun vessel, would have been sent down with the force if they'd been coming down to overrule the rebels. Because one thing you don't do when trying to overrule people is underwhelm them. And that's what this basically does. The actual battle. Well, on March the 1st, Scarborough, Tamar, Cherokee, and Hinchbrook sailed up the Savannah River. They were had two tra the transports coming them with between two and three hundred troops aboard, probably closer to two hundred troops, which were under Grant's command. I, rec I think sometimes the difference in numbers comes from the fact that some of the sailors and some other personnel like that were landed with the troops. They sailed up the back river and opposite, uh, anchored opposite the port area. Hinchbrook attempted to take a position above the town, but grounded on a sandbank in the river. Joseph Habersham's militia managed to, with gunfire alone, clear Hinchbrook's decks. They all went below deck, because they didn't want to get shot. But didn't have suitable boats, and if he had, probably would have found that there were other things to fire at them from. But, you know. Hinchbrook was therefore unable to take the boat. Uh, with the, uh, the Hinchbrook. Uh, Hamersham was therefore unable to take Hinchbrook. Sorry, too many H's. And it floated free on the next tide. Late on the evening of March 2nd, Grant's men, the Army Major, were landed a hunch of time. Now, why were their troops sent... This is this causes fun with people. They go, well, surely this was actually a military occupation. If, if they're sending troops to do actually anything, they won't be sending 200 and under the command of a major. They'll be sending more and at least under the command of Lieutenant Colonel. It's a fully loaded battalion of my love. I know, George Third wasn't actually a tyrant and in that sorry, he was... His ministers were idiots. And... But, as I've said earlier, it's one of those great myths that he was micromanaging the war. Really, George III wasn't the club. Cl that's the whole trouble with it, in that you, the British system at the time required either a prime minister or a king who would, who would take the lead. And you had neither in this period, which is why you had the problems. You had a prime minister, Lord North, who would have been the perfect vessel for a autocratic monarch to rule through but there wasn't an autocratic monarch to rule him <sighs> there was a I'm trying to be a constitutional monarch and listen to my ministers So what were they there for? Why do you have troops with you? Well, A, it wouldn't be the first time there had been disruption with loading in ports, so you probably needed your own security personnel, and it's not as if... The, let's be honest, you're not exactly relying on the local militias for security at this point. And if you consider what happened to Wright, that doesn't seem stupid, does it? Secondly, you might need... You know, those personnel are extra personnel to help load the ships, because... Frankly, it might be necessary to load them yourself because you might not be able to hire the dockers. Or rather, if you do hire them, they could have a go slow. And you're supposed to be loading up quickly to try and get the supplies to Boston, which is under siege. And thirdly, it never hurts to have some red coats turn up because them turning up gives the impression of you having a lot more available to you than you actually do, even if you are sending out penny packets. Grant's men were landed on Hutchinson Island on the 2nd of March. They made their way across the island and at 4am on March 3rd took a number of the rice boats anchored near the island. Now, here is the interesting thing. There are three potential options for this scenario. One, they were so massively stealthy 
as 18th century soldiers go, they manage to steal quietly onto the ships and take them all without raising alarm until 9 a.m. Five hours later. Or alternatively, the ship's captains and their crews, who were looking for a good profit, kept quiet and let them come aboard. You can decide on your own. Now, the arrival of ships on the March the 1st, coming up the river, had caused... Well, coming up the Savannah River to the Five Fathom Hole, etc. point, had caused the Committee of Safety to issue calls for the defence of the town and the ships, and um, which were sent to South Carolina's Committee of Safety as well. So when the alarm was raised, Colonel McIntosh, Lachlan McIntosh, took 300 militia and three four-pounder cannon onto Yamacraw Bluff. He then sends Lieutenant Daniel Roberts and Major Raymond Demerere the second under a parley of flag to one of the occupied ships where they were promptly arrested. That was unlikely to happen, wasn't it? When a second, larger parley group arrives to discuss the release of the two captives and the ships, Captain Rogers, leader of the party, was insulted. And so he fired at someone on the occupied ship. The British responded in kind, wounding one and very nearly sinking the parley group's boat. And as such, McIntosh opens fire with the cannons on the bluff. This began a gun battle which lasted for four hours and doesn't seem to resolve much. As such, Committee of Safety meets to discuss the situation and decides they shall burn the ship supply ships. And so a company of militia is assembled to do this task. And Inverness is torched and set adrift towards the occupied vessels, which causes the British troops and personnel to get off quickly uh, to try and abandon them in the face of the arriving fire ship. And during that confusion, the Patriots, the American insurrectionists, the... Uh, Amer the American independentists, whatever you want to call them, open fire with their gun, their artillery, and their own right, uh, their own rifles, muskets, and rake the British crews with musket fire and grape shot until they basically are able to get to cover. Two of the occupied vessels managed to get away downstream. Two more escape the flames by going upstream, but are forced to dock, and their crews are taken prisoner. And three ships succumb to flames, which burned into the night. They were then assisted by the arrival of about 500 South Carolina militia sent in response to the earlier appeal. It's pretty unusual. McIntosh then sends a parley to Barclay the next day offering a prisoner exchange. Barclay refused the exchange. So the Committee of Safety orders the actual arrest. They've already been sort of holding them under, con under house arrest of the remaining members of Wright's Council. And Wright therefore persuades the Barclay to um, release the British prisoners in exchange for promises of protection of those councillors. Which is probably the least valuable version of an exchange known to mankind. But we'll leave that to one side. They then went to Tybee Island, where they found that they had got 1,600 barrels of rice, which were loaded onto the two British transport ships, and the fleet remained anchored off Tybee Island uh, while negotiating went on exchange of prisoners. And during this time, they uh, managed to detain several of the arriving vessels, taking some prizes. And so on March 25th, a band of militia from Savannah burn all the houses on the island, and nine they used to write and the ship's officers because they you know they believe they've been living out of the living out of the houses. Which probably some of the army ones and some of the um some of Wright's people had been. So Barclay weighed anchor on March the thirtieth, sailed north, leading the convoy, and the British 
were found to have abandoned Boston on the 17th of March. So he tried Newport, Rhode Island, where the locals denied him any assistance and fired his ships using field artillery. So he eventually joins forces, the rest of British forces, at Halifax, Nova Scotia. Now, Wright's departure marked the end of British control over Georgia until Savannah is actually recaptured in December 1778. And he's the, Governor Wright is the only governor who actually reclaims his territory and keeps it in British hands until 1782. So he does owe some respect for actually achieving that one. But here is the big problem, and here is the reason why, once I start talking about all this stuff and all this American Revolution War, this turns from being two battles to really looking at one. And if it does go on too long, it is going to turn into a one battle video, because, um, and I'll do another little long patrol about the other one, because I want this to go live today, and I added all this stuff in today, so I'm re-recording this, and it's already almost six o'clock. If I want to go just to go live at a suitable time today, it's probably going to end up with only one of the battles involved. It happens. It's already about an hour and ten minutes long. The siege of Boston is a good example of how not to run a siege. Because the position is supposed to be the essential position for the British. And if you can control it, the British are in a great position. And it is an exceptional position in terms of this harbour. And as long as they have naval control, it's great. But the critical point here is the Dorchester Heights. As long as the Americans do not have heavy artillery up there that can control the entrance and challenge ships coming in along the channels, especially which are close to Dorchester Heights, and trying to get into Boston Harbour, you have control of it, and that gives you economic control virtually of the state. You're going to guess what happens. The British don't fortify Dorchester Heights. Okay, one fort. One decent star fort there. And they could have controlled Dorchester Heights and made it virtually impossible because... If you were trying to get to Dorchester Heights to lay siege on it, you would have to go and lay siege on that, and they could still get replied, resupplied by sea, as could Boston. And as long as they can get resupplied, they can be pretty much under siege indefinitely, especially with the British sea power. We've already talked about how many thousands of tons of transports, etc. This is being conducted across 4,000 miles of ocean, and the British are sending out so much. Yes, Germain is causing trouble with his insistence of doing everything different to what everyone else has managed to establish as a basic methodology of doing it. But, life happens. And they, could st they were still getting it through. But they don't. It gets taken. It falls. And this point is when people are going, well, you know, the siege of Boston, it's, it's uh, there's, it, you know, surely the British were doing the best they could. They're not. And I would put this squarely at the fault of Germain and Howe, who are actually in charge at the time. He has artillerymen, he has engineers, he has all the people he needs. And he doesn't do it. He has under siege in Boston. There are two entire divisions comprising five brigades of soldiers. Now, yes. Okay, are they all at perfect strength? No. But he has some region of between five and 11,000 soldiers. He loses about 1,000 at Bunker Hill. But still, he has a large army. He loses 60 fervor in the rest of the siege. But that should have been enough, and he should have been able to do, Dor do the Dorchester Heights and secure it 
and put something up there. He has Boeing with 70 guns, the whole British North American squadron, based in the, the vessels which are based in Boston, which is Boeing, 70 guns, Somerset, 68 guns, Asia, 64 guns, Preston, 50 guns, Mercury, 20 guns, Glasgow, 20 guns, Diana, 6 guns, Lively, uh, 20 guns. As said, in the nicest way, if the expedition to Savannah had been entirely, uh, had been at all about overawing locals, you could guarantee a some tro uh, Preston probably and Asia or Preston and Somerset would have headed uh, headed with them. You can also think that sort of the two hundred regulars from the fortieth regiment of foot. Well, the fortieth regiment of foot is part of fourth brigade under Brigadier General James Robertson in the second division up at Boston. They've got 11,000 troops roughly in that area. If they were sending an expedition of soldiers, considering they're under siege, and they need to get some people away to save them food, they could have sent a lot more. They've also got about two battalions of Royal Marines there. So, yeah, they could have detached them off. To, because they're in the 3rd Brigade and the 4th Brigade as well. <sighs> he has Major General Burgo John Burgoyne, the second commander of the 2nd Division, there. He has Major General Sir Henry Clinton there, under command of 1st Division. He has Commander... In William Howe is organising it, the Major General in charge. You see, there you go. That's a lot of troops. That's a lot of senior officers... They're not really the most effective people in the world, but you know, you've also got Colonel Cleveland, who's commander of the 4th Battalion Royal Artillery, there, who's commanding number uh, 1 Company, 2 Company, 4 Company, 5 Company, and 8 Company, plus the 2 Companies of Invalids are on, all under his command as the command of artillery and engineers. You have forces there. They could have done something, they didn't. And for those people who then go, well, you know, this is completely historical. Well, look, what happens in another part of the world? It's called the Great Siege of Gibraltar. So this is the same army, basically. These are the same troops. And if we consider the Great Siege of Gibraltar, if we look at the British Order of Battle, now, this caused me some fun when I started looking at it, because I was looking at it and going, really? At Gibraltar, there is the 12th, 39th, 56th, 58th, 65th, and 72nd Regiments of Foot. They had a major force of personnel. We have the 53rd Regiment of Foot, which is part of the force at Boston. We have the 52nd Regiment of Foot, which is in Boston. We have the 33rd, 47th and 43rd Regiments and 44th Regiments of Foot, and the 59th Regiment of Foot are in Boston. In simple terms, these units are contemporary equivalent units. And yet at Gibraltar, you have a siege which this lasts 10 months, 3 weeks and 6 days. This lasts 3 years, 7 months and 2 weeks. Point out this isthmus. The main line of attack which you can to attack Bosman. It's pretty narrow. The crucial point is that they have access to the sea because you have no you have no Dorchester Heights that allows the Spanish to control access to the sea. So when Rodney's fleet turns up, they can resupply. They have the fortifications dug in, but also they have George Augustus Elliot and Sir William Green there. 
your, that's your senior general and your senior engineer. Plus there's a very good Hanoverian general there as well. They have never more than 7,500 troops and 12 gunboats there. Facing off against 65,000 troops. 65,000 troops. Boston. The British are facing off against a maximum of 16,000. Mostly militia. Mostly militia. That's not, there's nothing wrong with being militia. And most of the militia are very well trained for militia. But if you look at those numbers and you go, right, and so at best the Americans is possibly seven to 5,000. It's the British smallest. Theoretically, they could be sixteen to 11,000. But either way, with the naval power the British had, there is no reason the British shouldn't have been able, especially if you consider, look at how Dorchester Heights is separated from the mainland by marshland and all the other issues that it has there. It should have been secured. In fact, it should have been secured earlier. There should have been a fort there to secure access to the sea. That should have been something which was done earlier. And again... Germain is Secretary of the Colonies from 1775. Ten months, three weeks, and six days. If Boston is your crown jewel, you defend it. But there is also another crucial difference. Boston is overseen by Germain. Sandwich that very nice gentleman, the polite gentleman, is overseeing Gibraltar. This comes under his domain. Yes, there is an army involved. Yes, the Northern Secretary is also part of it, because it's European affairs. But Gibraltar is considered first and foremost for its naval attributes, so Sandwich takes the lead. And he picks professionals. Elliot. Green. Men of great capabilities and great capacity to serve. Men who will put leaders, who will put the national interests and their people first above personal glories. The big thing here... If this little battle had been effective, there would be more food in Boston. The fact is, there are lots of little battles like Savannah. And lots of little issues with getting food to Boston. And maybe if there had been more food in Boston, maybe, maybe, possibly, the generals would have been more motivated to do things and they'd have actually managed to do something about Dorchester Heights. But the odds are not, because these were the generals chosen by Germain. And they were just as political, just as narrow-minded as he was. Right then. It's, I'm going to skip the Battle of San Nicholas today. And I am going to talk about that another time. Another video will be that. Small battles can be long in reach. The thing about the Battle of the Rice Boats is that it illustrates the problems with communications, it illustrates the problems the British have with command structure, with thought process going into their decision making. And this then builds up over time. And in the wider American Revolutionary War, it shows the issues the British are having. I would say the Anglo-French War and the American Revolutionary War is the first time the French managed to steal the march on Britain in almost a century in terms of getting their fleet ready first, in getting things out and about, and in dictating the war to the British. And there is a the reason that the French end up winning, arguably, the Anglo-French War. However, they still lose several major engagements. And it drives home to Britain. The first priority has to always be maintaining the fleet home defense 
People talk about World War One, etc., and these things of the fleets as being strategically strange, and Britain changing its priorities from defensive empire to defend of itself. No. Britain develops, especially after this scenario, and I a scenario which always works out quite sensibly. You defend Britain's infrastructure and industry first. In your when you're fighting European opponent. You beat them in Europe, in its fleet, sea, and you take their colonies from them. You go offensive in the rest of the world. But you always have the concentration of force necessary to defend Britain at sea. Because the same issues which Pitt shows when he danced around the French coast are only worse for the British. Because when you're dancing around the British coast, it goes the whole way round. I would love to say that the American Revolutionary Wars teach the British to getting bogged down in a continental war and fighting it the way they think a European war should be fought don't work. Because one of the things that will surprise me is the Americans are so manoeuvrable compared to the British forces. And yet the British have the maritime power. The British have control of the sea. They can manoeuvre with the forces. It should be. Savannah should have been a shock, a turn up of troops. Literally, if it had been a troop organisation, what and an actual organisation to do what James Wright thought it was, they should have turned up, strailed straight up to Savannah as far uh, far up the river as they could, with at least fifth rates, maybe even a fourth rate, and landed a couple of battalions of troops immediately, and gone. We're here. That would have been, that level of shock and awe would have probably worked. Not long term, but short term, it would have probably stabilised the situation. And who knows what Wright could have actually pulled out of his, um, his back pocket. Because he does seem to have quite a lot of uh, support in Georgia once it gets round. It's one of the interesting things is the careful, uh, careful efforts the Committee of Safety go to to try and cut off Wright from communicating the rest of Georgia. It's almost as if they're kind of paranoid that Georgia might not be as fervently revolutionary as they hope they are. Or rather, they're fervently revolutionary in the abstract concept of it, but when it comes to the pragmatic reality, they're a little less. You can learn a lot from the small battles of history which aren't covered often in the big books. Let's be honest. Nicholas Rogers. The one I've quoted from several times here. We'll tell you all about Jermaine. We'll tell you all about the history that was going on at the time. Won't tell, even mention the Battle of the Rice Boats. Why? Because it's not part of it. Because it's not part of the big framework they talk about. They'll talk about Boston. They'll talk about Yorktown, Saratoga, all these things. They won't talk about the small battles which shape the big battles. And they do. But those small battles can teach you a lot. Because often the smaller battles will magnify the problems of command because they don't because of a command structure big of issues that nations have of waging war because they won't have the mass to hide them. They won't have the mass to be able to hide those problems. I know. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this one. And today's question always good to end on a question is this. If you could go back and have a conversation with any revolutionary commander from either the British or the American side, or politician from the British or the American side, I'm going to say other than George Washington, because otherwise I'm going to get a lot of people just saying George Washington, and even I would like to go and have a chat with George, because there are some reports which say it was incredibly boring, and some reports which said he, you say he could be incredibly funny, and I would just like to find out which one it was. But... Other than the massive names, which of them would you like to talk? Uh, you would like to sort of pick secondary names, the secondary low, the sort of the less prominent politicians, etc., and the less prominent generals and admirals. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'd love to hear the names you at know that are actually known by the viewers. So, thank you for watching. Sorry about not covering the Battle of San Nicolas. That will be in another, its own separate video at some point this week coming. And uh, take care. Toodles.